Hi guys, it's Michael Grogan here again and in this video tutorial I'm going to be taking you through how we can use the Arima model to generate a forecast for a stock price time series going forward. So what we're going to be doing is if we load up our data here, we're going to be using um, price data for Johnson & Johnson from October 2006 all the way up to October 2016. So we have 10 year monthly data for Johnson & Johnson and we're going to be using the Arima model to conduct price forecasts on this data. So what we're going to do is we're going to do two things. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to get our data ready to um, run the Arima model and then secondly we're actually going to generate forecasts using the Arima model and um, validate our um, our data to make sure that we're getting accurate forecasts. So um, just to start straight off I'm going to load up my libraries. Second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be using the uh, first 96 data points in my time series and I'm going to be converting it into logarithmic format. Now the reason I'm using the first 96 data points is this is going to be my training data. Okay, This is going to be the data that I'm going to be using to actually build the Arima model. And then the remainder of the data, the 20% test data, we're actually going to be using that to compare with the forecasts generated by the Arima model. So we're going to be seeing how accurate is the Arima model that we're generating in predicting the actual um, prices of Johnson & Johnson. And the reason that we want to convert it into logarithmic format is because stock prices are based on returns and returns are based on percentages. So we're going to be converting the, uh, the price into logarithmic format to make sure that we're, we're, um, we're picking that, that attribute up in our time series. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run my autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation plots. Now, all autocorrelation is, is it is the correlation between one time, between a data point in a time series and its previous. So it's, it's the correlation between, between the lags, essentially. Now, in this particular autocorrelation plot, you can see that we have a very gradual descent in our lags. So each line going up represents the degree of correlation between our lags. And when you look at the partial autocorrelation function, we can see that we have an immediate drop in the correlation of the first lag. So from lag 0 to lag 1, there's a big drop. Now, from looking at that, this indicates that our data is stationary, i.e. it has a constant mean, constant variance, constant autocorrelation. Now, the reason that that's important is because when we work with a time series, we want to ensure that we have a stationary model because if we don't have a stationary model, then we have no way of of accurately forecasting mean variance and autocorrelation and so it's going to be quite difficult to infer proper forecasts from that data. Now that is the uh, quick and dirty method of screening for stationarity looking at the ACF and PACF plots. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to convert my uh, my time series. In other words, I'm going to get the differences between each each time series point. So you can see that here. And I'm going to be using the Dickey Fuller test to screen for stationarity across both the original time series and the differenced time series. So you can see that we have a p-value of 0.888 for our original LN time series. That indicates non-stationarity. However, for the, for the time series that we differenced, we now have a p-value of 0 0.01. So that indicates that we reject the null hypothesis at the 5% level and conclude that our, um, our, um, 
that we can reject a null hypothesis of non-stationarity. So what we're going to be doing is we're now going to be running our time series using auto Arima. Now we're going to be running it on the um, on the um, on the original um, log configuration because what Arima is going to do is it's going to choose the the number of differences for us automatically. So we're going to be using the auto Arima function, and what that's going to do is instead of picking instead of manually choosing the number of autoregressors, the order of the moving average model, and the number of differences. auto Rima is just going to do that for us automatically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this big block of code here, forecasting out 26 time periods. So that's just running there. Okay. So we can now see that we have an Arima configuration of 0, 1, 0 with drift. So our zero value, P, or the number of autoregressors is zero, and an autoregressor is where the price is being regressed on its past values. We have a difference of one, which is, what, which is what's necessary to make the time series stationary, as we've seen. And Q is also zero, and Q is the, moving aver the order of the moving average in our model. Now, the order of the moving average, what that's doing is it is calculating the past forecast errors instead of the past values because any model that we make is going to inherently have a certain degree of forecast error in it. So what the MA part of the model is doing is it's picking up the the you know the inherently random data in our own model, i.e. the current and lagged values of white noise process. And anyway, when, when we've actually come up with the configuration, which Auto Rima has done for us automatically, we come up with our final forecast values. And you can see here that we have used our exponent function to convert our logarithms back into, into raw price. So we're using the exp function in R, and we're converting our price back into, into um, a proper format. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be taking the remainder of the data and I'm going to be comparing it to the forecasts that Arima has actually generated for us. So when we run this, we can see that our mean percentage error is roughly 8%. So there's a roughly 8% deviation on average between the, um, the prices that Arima is forecasting for us. And the um, and the actual prices. So when I click in here, we can see that we have a data frame with both the actual price and the forecasted price. So we can say that roughly there is an eight percent deviation in what Arima is predicting for us and what the prices actually were. Now. Once we've run the Arima model, the last thing we want to do here is we want to use the long box test to see if our residuals are random. Now, the reason we want to do this is because if there is correlation between our residuals, then that's going to mean that, you know, it's going to cause problems in our time series model because it's not good to have correlations between your residuals and that could skew the accuracy of the estimates that we're getting. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be running the long box test with, with our null hypothesis being that our residuals are random. And the process for, um, for picking the lags here can be quite arbitrary. So I'm just going with lag 5, 10, 15 as standard. So when I run this, we can see that our p-values are all above 0 0.05 for lags 5, 10, and 15. And what this means is that we can't reject the null hypothesis that our residuals are random. And the long box test, again, provides another degree of evidence that the, the, the time series is suitable for use with Arima and that Arima is coming up with a, um, with, with a very reasonable forecast for us. 
So that's how you would use the ARIMA model to forecast a time series and how you would format the time series itself to ensure that you're using ARIMA in the right way. Um, there's a fuller example of this on my website, so you can, feel free to access that and um, attempt to run the results yourself. And uh, that just about wraps it up for this tutorial. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.